So once again, warm welcome to everyone to our second in this two series webinars on scaling up place-based good initiatives project uh, led by wonderful University of Leeds team. My name is Letizia and I am in the Food Foundation. I lead our local food policy work and I've been working very closely with the teams um, with the team at Leeds on this project. So for those of you um, who haven't uh, been able to join previously, this is a project um, which is looking at how local food programs impact can be scaled to regional and national levels. And in the first webinar that we held in April, we explored the methods that we employed to identify and recruit those priority places using the Priority Places for Food Index or PPFI. And we started looking at some of the case studies and food hubs that we visited at that time. Uh, but today in the second webinar, we now that we've completed all of the visits and the case study report is finalized, we wanted to share the research findings with you and uh, the policy implications and how we're going to disseminate uh, those more widely. And we have a wonderful team from University of Leeds and myself to uh, then answer any of your questions at the end. We hope to have um, significant time allocated for Q&A at the end. So please do feel free to post in questions as, as we go along. So without further ado, I'm going to pass on to Gemma, who is going to take us through the findings. Thank you very much, Leticia. So nice to meet everybody. Um, so today's webinar, as Leticia mentioned, we're just going to give a bit of a background into the project for those that may not have been able to attend before, just need a refresher. Um, we'll then go over the current project, looking at the aims and objectives. We'll provide some case studies um, of the food hubs we visited and provide some examples. We'll then talk through some of the takeaways. This is when I'll pass over to Effie. Um, talk through the policy implications and looking at the um, at the end, we'll come together and we'll summarise and we'll have plenty of time for questions. So, first of all, so what are place-based food initiatives? Well, this is a term that we have kind of come up with because food hubs was a was a difficult um, term to define. And it's something that is thought of and is understood differently by different people. So for this project, we have defined place based food initiatives as organizations or groups of people that support households to access adequate food. And they also support health and well-being and or promote the transition to a more sustainable circular based community food system. So examples of the organisations initiatives that we worked with include food banks, social supermarkets and food pantries, which are organisations that people can become members of, um, pay a weekly or monthly fee, can access fo food at much more affordable prices and often sometimes or often or sometimes can also come along with kind of additional financial or wellbeing support. And in addition to these, other examples include community cafes and kitchens um, and community gardens and farms. So for this project, we are building on the previous project we did, um, where there's also webinars you can you can watch back on. It's on the GFEI um, YouTube. We've got some links at the end. Um, and so in the first project, we explored the benefits of place based food initiatives. Um, and we did this in Leeds, working with over 30 different food hubs or place based food initiatives and the council in the city to explore the different benefits and impacts that these organizations have. So there were four key areas that we identified with the food hubs themselves. So first of all, their role in enhancing sustainability. So they do this through reducing food waste, for example, using surplus food to produce meals or to create food parcels. Um, they also reduce greenhouse gas emissions for example, through composting or helping people to access more local food. Again, they do that through reducing food miles. So, for example, for community farms, growing fruit and vegetables in the city um, enables people to access those foods without having to without those foods having to be transported. Um, and other examples include improving biodiversity and improving soil quality, for example, through composting. Um, another one of the areas of benefits that we identified with the food hubs, place-based food initiatives, is their role in strengthening healthy local food systems. So, for example, by providing access to land or facilities for food growing, they can help people to improve their food literacy, understandings of how food is grown, and also empower people to grow their own food. 
Um, they can raise awareness of the benefits of healthy local food, for example, through cooking classes or through nutrition awareness courses or just through conversations in the organisations and initiatives themselves. And then, for example, they can also support people to access and purchase healthy local food, for example, through social supermarkets. Another area of benefit that was identified is, there, is the role of the place-based food initiatives in supporting the local economy. So, for example, they can generate revenue. So one example from one of the case studies we'll be sharing is a cafe that um, supports local people to access food, but also ask for donations and also has a cafe that um, people pay to attend. And that in turn generates revenue for the organization. Um, the organizations can also employ staff and provide volunteering opportunities for the community. And other areas of benefit in this in this uh, section include facilitating connections between smaller or other local businesses and large organizations. And then finally, the fourth area of benefit that was identified is the role of place-based food initiatives in improving well-being. So, for example, they offer physical activity classes to improve physical, physical health. They can improve mental health through supporting people to manage their finances, uh, reduce stress, and also access support and signposting. And they can also, for example, through group activities, promote opportunities for social connection. So this, um, these benefits that were identified were used then to inform the next phases of the research. Um, and in that next phase, we produced an evaluation toolkit, which in this current project we have used to implement. Um, and using that, we have also worked with a range of different place-based community-led food initiatives to understand how they can scale up, out or deep. So up into, so these various things came out of conversations, exploring how we can work with these organizations to either increase their number, um, increase their size, or look at the ways in which we can support them to reduce some of the, the root causes of the reasons why people are in need of food support, for example, in the first place. Um, and so the objectives of the current project, we had five different objectives. The first objective was to scope areas of high food insecurity, food insecurity risk using the CDRC's Priority Places for Food Index. So this um, index we have linked at the end. We mentioned it in our methods webinar, so I recommend you go and have a look at that. And if you have any specific questions about this process, um, Michelle and Rachel at the end can answer those questions. So objective two was to identify a portfolio of diverse food initiatives. So this diversity was looking at them in terms of their size, the number of people they were supporting, the focus of their work, or the form of organization they were. So were they a food bank, were they a social supermarket, were they a community farm? And so we, we aim to collect and work with a range of different organizations. The next objective was for us to produce 10 case studies and recommendations about how organizations such as these can scale out or up or deepen their impact. These case studies are available on our webpage and also we will be talking through some of those in the next bit of the webinar. Um, the fourth objective was to map relevant policy and decision makers across the UK. And this is where we really worked, really worked with uh, the Food Foundation to do this. And they also are working with us now to ensure that we can um, share our insights and look at ways in which we can support these organizations to increase their impact um, in the longer term. And then finally, carrying out this program of engagement, including this webinar, but also we're looking to do conferences and podcasts so that we can share the insights as far and as wide as possible to help these organizations in the best way we can. So just to reiterate what we mean by up, out, or deep, because that is kind of key to this project. So scaling up is increasing the size of the organization. So for example, can they be supported to increase their budgets through funding or through other means? So for example, can they generate revenue through cafes or can they generate revenue through the food they're growing to support more people? The second option we're looking at is scaling out. So this is increasing the number of organizations for example, taking an organization from a local area and can they grow to become regional? 
And the third area we're looking at is scaling deep, which is looking at how we can collaborate or how the organisations can collaborate with others to look at how we can target the root causes of food insecurity, but also financial insecurity, um, physical Ill health, mental ill health. And across this project, we've been talking with the different organisations and thinking and reflecting ourselves about when, how and if organisations should be looking to scale up, out or deep because not in all situations should they be looking to do these things based on the current focus. Sometimes the first approach and the first need is to look at how we can work with these organizations to move from a food emergency, so a food aid emergency situation, to one that's more resilient and robust in the longer term. Um, but this, these are the questions and this is the kind of scope that we've been looking at throughout the project. So, as I mentioned, we did 10 different case studies um, across the UK. So this map here shows the various different areas we looked at. We looked and make sure that we had case studies from Scotland, England, Wales and Northern Ireland. And also across those different case studies, making sure that we were including um, various food hubs that were doing lots of different work. So, for example, um, the Pulp Friction in Nottingham, for example, is an organisation that works with people with learning difficulties and special needs that need that also need access to food, but also need access to um, support with employability skills, somewhere to go in the daytime, places, people that they can make friends with. And through the work that they do, they use surplus food and everything. And the young people that attend Pulp Friction have also developed a close working relationship with um, the fire brigade and the police, and they offer um, catering services using surplus food with the young people involved in making that food every day. So in contrast to that, we look at Burnagree Food Bank in Sheffield. So that is a food bank. Um, they are part of the Trussell Trust Network and they primarily are there to support people who are in crisis, so in who need emergency food parcels. Um, and they do that four times a week across two different sites. And they have been doing that for the last, um, I think it's five years, but we'll come back to them. Um, and they primarily do emergency food aid. Okay, so we're looking at some of the case studies in a bit more detail. So first of all, we have North, North Glasgow Community Food Initiative. So this organization is based in Glasgow um, and they are a charity, community led charitable organization they do a range of different activities, but it's all led by the community. So the organization empowers the community to offer programs for their um, for their other people in the community or for themselves. So for example, they the community lead cooking courses or cooking classes. They lead gardening sessions in the garden that the organization has, um, has purchased. They have a community cafe and offer community meals, um, again, using surplus food or food that they've grown in the garden and they have a volunteering program to support local people to develop their employability skills and confidence that they need to be able to go out and find work or to make friends and feel more connected with their community. Um, one of the kind of key aspects of this organization is that they have developed in a way that they are almost financially sustainable. So they generate over 20,000 pounds in revenue every year through their community cafe. They are still, um, heavily reliant on grant funding, but this revenue supports them to ensure that they can offer many of their services and many of their activities in the longer term. So when we're looking at North Glasgow Community Food Initiatives, we worked with them to go through the Food Hub Evaluation Toolkit, and we looked at some of the impacts that they're having. So first of all, we looked at food insecurity and the economy, um, and they the organisation provides a community fridge and pantry so these um, activities enable people to access affordable, healthy food. They also do a lot of advocacy work to ensure that people can access sustainable local foods in, across, in and across Glasgow. And they also employ staff and offer volunteering opportunities, again, to support people with those employability skills or to get their first foot on the ladder of work. Another area of impact is in terms of sustainability and resilience. So North Glasgow Community Food Initiative, they utilise food surplus to make many of their meals, and this helps reduce food waste. When I went to visit, they made uh, pizza, 
with um, flour that they'd got from a local mill in in Scotland, and then they were using surplus food to to top those. And those pizzas were being given to children who were attending um, a film in the evening, which was it was great. It was super nice to be there and to see this in practice. Um, other areas of impact for sustainability and resilience include growing local food in their allotment and community farm, community garden, sorry. Um, and they support biodiversity by growing the fruit and vegetables and have a composting area. And then looking at other areas, they improve health and well-being in the local community, for example, through offering cooking classes. Um, they support people through emotional well-being through gardening sessions and support and promote social connections through community meals, gardening groups and cooking clubs. And then finally, the fourth area of impact is in terms of access and demand for healthy food. So this, this organization uses food throughout everything because they feel that it is something that can bring people in and helps people to feel connected. But in, in this kind of specific area, they also provide access to land for food growing, support the purchase of healthy food through their, through their community fridge. And they offer a diverse range of healthy, local and culturally appropriate foods through their pantry and their cafes and the food that they offer. So one of the key areas that were through this project that we've been thinking through, both with the organisations and as a research team, is what can we take away from this organisation when we're looking back to scaling up, out or deep? So the impacts and the takeaways, sorry, the takeaways we took from North Glasgow Community Food Initiative is that the community takes that central role in choosing, planning and running activities so that they feel empowered, there's community development, the community's feeling developed, and they're better, they're more cohesive. Second, by adopting a community engagement model, they aim to put the resources at the disposal of the local people, empowering them to take a lead in improving their own and other people's diets, health and well-being, which helps then in turn to support their families and the local community. And as I mentioned, food is central to everything that North Glasgow Community Food Initiative does, from food growing, cooking, choosing, accessing and eating. They work with partners and promote their opportunities alongside their own to make sure that there is choice and accessibility. And this then in turn helps them to scale out their impact. So going to a different organisation, this is the Warehouse, um, based in New Townlands in Northern Ireland, just outside of Belfast. So the Warehouse is part of the North Down Community Work Social Enterprise, which is a mental health organisation supporting young people across Northern Ireland offering uh, mental health support in schools and this social enterprise generates some revenue which they can then use to support the warehouse in the work that they're doing. So the warehouse offers several many different activities it was when I went to visit it was quite amazing to see the range and diversity of, of activities that they offer but primarily the activities relating to food include a social supermarket, a community meal, three times a week for anybody. Um, they have food um, freezers, they have uh, dry foods that's available every day. And they also offer the social, social, social supermarket called Well Fed, which is only for um, those people that are looking for direct need, indirect need. And they offer alongside that financial and wellbeing support. And those individuals and families that attend this Well Fed social supermarket can only attend this for six months because in that time they are given the support and um, guidance that they need or they should need to be able to identify ways in which they can become more financially resilient, develop cooking skills, understand what a healthy balanced diet looks like and how they can budget for food for their family. Another aspect of the warehouse is that they embrace a circular economy approach to everything they do. So from, for example, they offer um, a community sewing group and they use rags and clothes that have been donated by the local community for that. And they also develop, for example, in those classes, they make blankets that they then give to the local hospital. All the food that's served is surplus food from the local supermarkets. They also have a work, working relationship with a local farm who gives them surplus fruit and vegetables and herbs. Um, and so everything they do is trying to work together with the community. So looking at some of the impacts that the warehouse has, um, again, they support access to affordable, healthy lo local food. They do this through a community fridge and freezer 
which are all open four days a week and are non-referral. So anybody can go and that is key part of their, their work. It's, there's no questions asked. It's whoever whoever needs it, whoever wants to go. They operate the social supermarket, as I mentioned, and that has wraparound care and support for financial health and well-being. Um, and they also have community meals four days a week, which feeds over 400 people using surplus food. Then in terms of their sustainability and resilience impacts, they offer a wear and share community exchange shop four days a week, which is free to use. Um, and it's basically, a, it's like a charity shop, but it's free. Anybody can go and use and take what they need. Um, there's no stigma associated with this. It's just for everybody. Um, they also share excess clothing donations with other local organizations. And as I mentioned, they make blankets for local hospitals and they offer upcycling and sewing sessions to help reduce waste. In terms of health and well-being, the warehouse provides mental health signposting and support. They promote community cohesion and connection by offering uh, craft, cooking, food, joinery clubs for adults of all different types, ages and interests. And they also offer a range of signposting services for such as debt advice, benefits and housing support. And then finally, in terms of access and demand for healthy local food, they offer community gardening and growing sessions. They have the social supermarket. They offer fruit and vegetables via the community fridge, freezer and cupboard. And they're developing a, a strong relationship with a local cooperative farm to utilize and share their produce, both in terms of kind of paid um, fruit and veg trays, but also fruit and veg that they can serve in the cafe. So looking at the takeaways that we developed with the warehouse and as part of a research team, we identified the fact that they don't take any referrals for any of their activities for the community fridge, freezer or cupboard. This that they highlighted helps to minimise stigma and helps to keep the focus on reducing food waste rather on food charity. Second, they are really um, keen to make sure that they're developing a circular food economy and it's absolutely central to the work. From toys and clothing to food and activities, everything that they can is purchased from and donated to local people and organisations. And finally, as they're part of the Northland Community Works, which is also so a North, also a North Newtownlands based social enterprise, they are, have a sustainable source of income, which also gives them access to social support when needed for those people that are most need. Okay, so a third case study, um, again, different. So this is in churches and they've been running for over 10 years. Um, in churches offers, um, many different activities and support and they initially started to support pe home, people experiencing homelessness across Bradford um, but now and over the last few years um, they have developed the Food Savers Network which was developed to provide a connected system of social supermarkets. So members of the Food Savers Network are encouraged to save into a credit union to promote financial resilience but they can also by paying a weekly fee um, which is typically six pounds, they can access fresh and store covered food, which tip, which if they were to shop at a supermarket, would have cost over 30 pounds. So um, in churches and then the Food Savers Network, which includes over 20 different organisations across Bradford, Leeds, Calderdale, and extending across beyond Yorkshire as well, um, enables people to access affordable food and save into the, so the credit union so they can become financially resilient. So looking at some of the impacts of in churches and the Food Savers Network. Um, so for first of all, they support food insecurity and the economy by contributing to um, by enabling people to access affordable food. They advocate for the local economy as part of a local campaigning to help people to access food. They facilitate connections between themselves and many other charitable organisations in Bradford and beyond. And they help people to access financial or other support so that people can feel more financially and become more financially resistant, resilient. And then looking at sustainability and resilience, the organization reduces food waste by using surplus food when possible in the social supermarket and also in their cooking classes that they offer. They encourage allotment owners to donate fresh produce through Share Your Spare, which is an allotment food recovery scheme. And as I mentioned, they've developed the Food Savers Network of social supermarkets. Then looking to health and well-being in churches and the wider Food Savers Network, help people to improve their physical and mental health through um, signposting, through volunteering opportunities. And they also offer NISI classes to support new mothers to become entrepreneurs. 
Then looking at the access and demand for healthy local food, they offer food growing packs and work with local allotments. They help people to access fruit and vegetables through providing vouchers. And they raise awareness for the benefits of healthy local food through cooking classes and conversations. So takeaways from in churches and the wider Food Savers Network is that they employ a food pantry model that empowers members to make their own choices regarding food for them and their families. This has been highlighted across several of the different organisations we visited as being really important to enabling people to, to get out of the cycle of emergency food access. They also combine access to affordable food with a credit union scheme. This helps reduce dependency on food aid whilst also promoting dignity and financial resilience. And this is a key strategy for scaling deep by tackling root causes of food insecurity. And finally, they also offer cooking classes to promote healthy eating, enable people to develop food literacy and cooking skills and develop social support for community cohesion and knowledge sharing. Okay, so quickly for the fourth case study here is Fine Futures. This is based on the Isle of Bute in Scotland, um, which is just off the coast of Glasgow. The Fine Futures supports islanders with access to affordable and seasonal fresh fruit and vegetables, which was absolutely critical during COVID when their one supermarket on the island was closed for a period of time. And additionally, they offer employment and volunteering programmes to support people, local people resilience and community development. So looking at some of the impacts of fine futures, in terms of food security in the economy, um, they grow fruit and vegetables, they employ full-time staff to work on the community garden, and they worked with the Royal Botanic Gardens of Edinburgh to develop a train-the-trainer model to help more people to develop horticultural skills. Looking at health and well-being, fine futures have helped to improve health and emotional well-being through the community garden. They also offer a volunteering programme and an employability programme which are run over the course of a period of weeks to enable people to develop the skills they need to access employment opportunities, both on the island and, and more on the mainland. Looking at sustainability and resilience then, um, Fine Futures helps to reduce greenhouse gases through Restyle, which is a furniture and upholstery um, reuse and recycling scheme. That is also part of their employability programme, so enabling people to access those opportunities to develop the skills. They have, able, they have um, started promoting and enabling active travel through Bike Butte, which is an electric bike scheme. And then looking at access and demand for healthy local food, they raise awareness of a healthy local food in schools. They advocate for local sustainable foods across policy, and they provide fresh seasonal herbs, fruit and vegetables via the Green Box scheme. So in terms of the takeaways for Fine Futures, they have a diversity of work which is developed devel delivered by an established volunteer team. This enables them to be resilient and to respond to new challenges and opportunities. Many of the programs are dri driven by the community itself and they do regular consultations to ensure the activities respond to the community's needs. So for example, responding to fresh food shortages or unemployment. This is a strategy for scaling out their impact beyond food provision. And finally, two of the key pillars involve people and the environment. And this is always considered when Fine Futures is delivering and developing any activity. This ensures the organisation stays close to its mission and meets the needs of the community. OK, <clears throat> so I'll pass over to Effie now. Um, thank you very much, Gemma. Um, hello, everyone. Um, yeah, thank you, Gemma, for giving us such a rich account of all the wonderful work and um, the impact these organisations have. Just to say, we just had to pick a few. There's 10 uh, plus another 10 from the Leeds um, work that we did focusing just in Leeds. So please do visit the link and, and um, provide it in the chat and, and see all the, the work that the other organizations as well are, are doing. Um, so Gemma has already touched upon a, a few of those takeaways when she was presenting the case studies, but I'll just go in a little bit more, more detail and try to summarize what we saw. Because essentially in this project, we didn't just want to understand what the, these organizations do and the impact that they have, but also look at the different strategies that they employ or try to um, in order to increase you know, the, 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 the big positive impact that they're having in all those domains that we've talked about at, um, right at the beginning. Um, and we group them under those scaling up, scaling out, scaling deep type of um, groupings, categories, but in reality, they, they interact and they're not as, you know, 
box team. Um, so we're just going to give you a, a few examples um, on how these organizations, what we've seen, these strategies are, are useful. And the purpose of this is also to share across um, the sector so that we can have some peer learning um, happening through this uh, webinar. So one of the ways that this organization tried to scale up was by building financial resilience as an organization themselves. And um, we've seen a lot more um, of this model, the social enterprise model popping up. Uh, so what that means is having a particular activity that generates revenue and using that as a means to fund other activities that um, need funding and might not have happened otherwise. So the way house, as, as Gemma talked about, was an example of, of doing that. So generating revenue through, for example, community cafe, and that's something that the North Glasgow Community Initiative has been doing as many, many other of these organizations. Um, another way to do that is by embedding themselves within the community. So we've seen this cooperative model uh, where the organization is partly um, owned by the members, um, so trying to to work along those lines as a ways to uh, to increase that um, resilience within um, themselves and find futures is is um, one an example of that. So if we can move on to the next slide, Gemma, that would be great. Um, thank you. So. Um, another way um, they're trying to increase uh, their impact is by scaling out. So increasing the scope is one way that these organizations did that. Um, so food would be the main thing that would bring the people in. But while they're there and they feel part of a, a friendly, trusted, um, safe environment, then um, these organizations would co-locate other services so they would offer other things that might have nothing to do with food um, to support their members um, so that could be mental health support or financial and debt support um, and and other other um, services housing um, and we saw that that was a really important way that um, you know these organizations could have a greater impact um, increasing their reach by via a partner organization. So we talked about the In Churches Food Savers um, Network uh, examples before, one of the case studies that Gemma presented and Julie is on the call. So if you have any questions, <laughs> do, do ask. Um, so by uh, having a model where uh, it creates a bit of a network. So the main organization is there and it supports other, uh, in this case, in In Churches and Food Savers Network uh, pantries to set up. Um, and by having that network, they support each other um, along the way. And, you know, the, the, it's, it's a really uh, good model. And then you have a bit of a, a web of activity across, in this case, in, in churches, primarily in Bradford, um, in, in an area. Um, um, a third way of trying to do that is expanding the focus. So having a collective model of community action. So we're looking here at an example is the Active Wellbeing Society in Birmingham. So we're looking at things beyond food and we're talking about um, yeah, the model of, of a collective organization. In a lot of the time there, we, we saw examples where food insecurity action and justice was linked with um, climate action um, and this type of um, initiatives as well. And we can move on. Lovely, thank you. Um, then scaling deep, by scaling deep, we try to, um, we're trying to, you know, to talk about activities that are trying to deal with the root causes of of food insecurity in, in this um, case. So again, Julie, you have a lot to talk about. Um, food savers and in churches that do that quite a lot. They have employed this credit union uh, saving scheme whereby the members would, uh, the pantry members would um, uh, give, uh, I think six pounds, correct me if I'm wrong, and one of those pounds would go to a saving scheme. So this is a way to help their members come out of debt, um, have some savings uh, and, uh, trying to make them financially more resilient uh, themselves. And this is linked to um, one aim that I think everybody we talked to um, has had, which was to reduce dependency on food aid. Um, and another example of, of how 
organizations do that is by trying to develop employability skills. Many, many organizations do that. We just picked out Fine Futures here um, that was doing that. And it was um, teaching people in terms of horticultural skills, growing food growing skills, etc. cetera. Um, promoting dignity and choice, um, obviously, is a big priority uh, because there's a lot of stigma associated with people accessing this um, this these activities and these services so the food pantry model is trying to do that uh, whereby uh, the members would pay a, a, a fee and then they would have the choice um, to pick what they want rather than being given and what they need rather than being given a set amount of um, staples and that's it in a food parcel for example so giving that choice uh, increases the the dignity of participating um, in this activity um, another way of trying to change the broader context within which we're finding these organisations operating is through policy advocacy. Um, and all organisations do that to a certain level by just, just by being part of the debate that is going on and um, engaging in, in those discussions, um, but also trying to have a more direct route to policy um, advocacy. So for example, we've picked up here a Trust or Trust food bank and Trust or Trust being a big organization across um, um, nationally um, has big campaigns that it calls for action um, in this um, in, in many of these um, areas. Um, and then, oops, sorry. So then we're trying to, yeah, is there the, the funding bit? There you go. So just, just to clarify, <laughs> In the previous uh, webinar, I was in controlling the, uh, um, they had given me control of the, the arrows to move the slides and I completely messed up, hence now it has been taken away from me, which is probably a very good, um, very good reason. So trying to take those um, insights and, and see what the policy implications are uh, beyond just the, the organisation. So funding is a big theme and, and we are developing those policy implications and are thinking around that. So these are first, um, first insights. So we're still working this out. Funding obviously is a big issue. Um, there's big reliance on grant funding and or donations that makes these organizations really precarious. They can't um, put them in a precarious situation. They can't plan that easily. We know that the household support fund is coming to an end. Um, uh, so this is a big, uh, big implication that we need to, to change that situation if we want more uh, long-term uh, solutions. So the way that these organizations are being funded needs to be, um, needs to change to become more sustainable. And by that we meet um, more long-term and more well-planned, um, but also funding to um, to support, you know, address the, the, the root causes of food insecurity. So that goes beyond um, these activities. So looking at why people find themselves in, in food insecurity. Um, so that sustainable funding in terms of the organizations themselves could help them transition towards more community-based circular food system approach. So that community support and development um, essentially model rather than just uh, addressing um, you know, an immediate need. Um, and that's something that a lot of the organization talked to us that they would like to make that transition. So supporting them in that transition through uh, targeted funding is, is a priority. So we can move on to the next one now, please. Lovely, thank you. Um, coordination is, is another uh, theme that we have identified that is needed. This is an ecosystem of organizations that they interact with each other, but also other food, uh, local and regional um, actors. Coordination across those actors in this ecosystem is really important. Um, to, to have that joined up thinking and encourage that systems approach rather than um, tackling individual um, problems. Um, this is part of this type of um, you know, coordination that is need uh, and we're trying to, to share the findings of what we are, uh, you know, our findings of our research to, to facilitate that peer learning and uh, coordination amongst uh, the different actors. So the next slide, please. Um, Another big theme that we're seeing emerging and we think has potential is um, integration of those activities within the wider landscape of health and care and social care. Um, that would support this type of um, 
uh, effort and initiatives to become more sustainable and more long term, um, long term, you know, viable in the long term. So by integrating within health and social care systems, what we mean, some examples could be of um, social prescribing. So we have seen examples where the community growing, for example, um, activities, uh, GPs or social services would um, uh, prescribe people to go and sign up for that as, as, as a way to connect with other people, as a way to increase their mental health. Um, so having that integration of those sort of third sector community led uh, food uh, sector, but also with the health and social care is an opportunity that we see could um, potentially provide a, a really good pathway to support the most vulnerable in these communities. Um, and I think that's all from me. Um, and I hand over now to Letizia, who's going to talk a bit more on the on the part of the project that the Food Foundation has been leading and is still leading and there's more work to be done. Thank you. Great. <clears throat> Thank you, Effie. So as I mentioned at the start, the Food Foundation um, has been supporting this project from the policy advocacy and engagement um, perspective. And as we now have the case study report and we are moving into the dissemination phase of which this webinar is part of, we're looking at the opportunities that we have to engage with um, policymakers, specifically in the context um, that we are operating now with the new government and uh, many new MPs. We see the opportunity uh, to engage directly with some of the MPs from those places and um, actually kind of organize and look at opportunities that might be for them to visit some of the existing food hubs and then start thinking about both from the local and the national perspective what the policy implications may be as Effie mentioned what kind of <clears throat> models in terms of funding and specific policy asks to support the more sustainable um, community food systems that would remove the dependency on just the emergency food provision could look like. So to do that, uh, we are working on a policy brief that we hope to have in um, September that we could then share with both local and national policymakers. Um, we are also working more closely now with uh, metro mayors across the UK. So we see the opportunity to engage on this topic um, with regional governments as well as national governments and then in terms of the existing forums where we think that uh, it would be useful and, and good to present these findings we have the um, local network called the UK Urban Food Forum which is a knowledge exchange network for policymakers that work in a local government specifically and the session that we are running in October is specifically going to look at food equality strategy so if you are from local government and would like to join this forum, uh, please do get in touch and we will forward the invite for that session as well. And then, as I already mentioned, um, in terms of the national policy engagements, the Food Foundation is looking at um, engaging with the new MPs and exploring uh, what opportunities there might be to uh, support some of these community food initiatives uh, in their constituencies. And then there will also be a series of um, journal papers, uh, articles that we will be uh, looking to publish in peer-reviewed papers and presenting these findings at um, conferences. We are still exploring uh, which, which conferences might be um, most suitable. So if you, you know of a good conference or you think this could be useful to present on, please do let us know in the chat as well. And then finally, we are going to be producing um, a podcast that will be uh, part of our uh, dissemination. So probably sometime in late August or September, early September, we will have a podcast where we are going to bring some of the voices as well from the from the food hubs and places that we visited to bring that to life even more. And then um, there will be further blogs and activities happening uh, in autumn as well. So those are just some of the next steps in terms of where we are hoping to take this research. 
and um thank you thanks to all of all of the participants and, and all of you we hope to get um more uh, opportunities to share this widely great um i think we can go to the next and the last slide so before we go to the q a so these are all of the links to the case study solution toolkit and uh, ppfi uh, which we've already shared through throughout the chat but we will also share the slides so you will get all of these links and the qr code uh, is also available for you to scan now and we um have just over 10 minutes now for q a and i think it would be yeah it would be good if um we could get all of the speakers and the team on uh, camera back. I can't see any in the Q&A, but because we are a relatively small group, if you have a question and would rather not type, just raise your hand, we can see you, and then we can uh, let you in to ask your question. Really great. Um, we have Emily, so, sorry, Marie, Emily. Please do um, feel free to come in. Hello, can you hear me? Hi, yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Hi, hi, I am so glad to be here. And what an amazing uh, bit of work you've been doing here. It's really, really exciting. It's bang on the kinds of things I've been working on. So. Uh, yeah, really spot on. Uh, I'm in Edinburgh and I'm a, an advocate for regenerative uh, urban based food ecosystems. And what I've been particularly interested in uh, over the last wee while is exploring new ways of investing in those ecosystems, because as we've just been hearing, funding is critically uh, difficult. And even when organisations try to be very inventive in seeking social enterprise ways of operating, they're still stacked up against a very, very uneven playing field in terms of the food system. So I'm really interested, and that's my question really, uh, in knowing whether you explored, uh, you know, novel ways or have any thoughts about novel, novel ways of investing. And I don't mean from the public sector necessarily, but really thinking out of the box in how we can invest in supporting place-based regenerative food ecosystems. Um, I, I'm gonna, um, um, sorry, uh, Marie, Emily, thank you so much for your comment and your question. This is, um, you know, this is a big question that we're having and we're trying to, we're battling through ourselves um, and, it is a quite dynamic situation. So things are evolving and we're seeing a bit of a change. Um, so I like the fact that you're talking about investment, right? Because it is something, is funding that is there to, uh, that gives back a lot. And I think part of this project was that we wanted to show how much these initiatives give back in so many different ways. Um, I think, it's a quite tricky one because, as I said, we have a very established and a very uneven in terms of power um, food system. Um, so what we can see where that funding could be coming, where that uh, investment could be coming is from more local and regional sort of pathways, if that makes sense. Um, so. For example, we're looking at another project that could be uh, linked to that is through public procurement. So you're not necessarily uh, funding, you know, giving a, a grant to, to an initiative to operate, but by linking institutions and anchor um, organizations in a particular region. Um, so the, the, the local authority or the university, this type of institutions or local NHS, you know, um, uh, you know clinics or hospitals. Um, and connecting them to local produce through those um, initiatives uh, could be one way of investing in those and providing that financial um, stability a little bit and more regular um, income that can then help them plan long term and also fund, um, you know, other activities that might not, you know, otherwise happen. Um, that was my my initial thought about it, but um, less not necessarily public, na uh, nationally channeled funding, but more local authority, uh, regional 
uh, type of um, investment. Uh, if you're thinking about more private investment routes, we haven't come across anything like that. So I would love to hear if you have some examples, um, please do share. So I don't know I, if- um, I have an I example know, so of just that, FB, actually. Yes, so in some of the work that I'm involved with, um, we have seen those examples. So there's a big partnership between Rabobank and City Harvest in London, where the, the big bank is investing in supporting a place-based food initiative. But I think there's um, more work to do to kind of understand how that model works and whether there's a way of kind of creating a framework for other ways of doing that. So yeah, I don't have very much more to say, but I think there is a lot we can learn and we are working together with, a different, with another project to look at how we do that. And I've just been typing um, as you've been speaking, Effie, um, about the investor coalition in food policy that the Free Foundation is part of. Um, and we can find more information about uh, the work that coalition is doing, but it's exactly kind of exploring some of these opportunities and issues that um, is potential, that has the potential to transform the, the food system. And therefore, um, we want to involve businesses and investors as well in, in some of those uh, projects. So you can find more on um, that in in on our link on our website, which I've just shared, but I think I haven't shared with everyone. So I will just reshare that. Great. Um, so we have another question in the chat uh, from Branda. And she wants to know about how do we start, how do we decide on the four key key areas of impact? Shall I come in? Do you want to come in? Yeah, or you, Rachel? Yeah, of course. Um, so we use the Priority Places for Food Index, which was developed by the Consumer Data Research Centre with the consumer group WITCH, um, to scope. We had a short list of areas, um, and then. Gemma basically looked at um, place-based food initiatives that, that might be good case studies within a short distance of those or within those case study, shortlisted case study areas. Um, so priority places for food index gives each score, uh, each area, sorry, so this is small neighborhoods, um, a score of food and security risk. And then we kind of looked at um, a larger area. So we scaled this up and, and looked at areas that were um, over 80% uh, high food and security risk and, and that kind of shot on the short list. Um, if you are interested in the, the methods in detail, though, I would probably go and have a look at the, the first seminar that we did because we we talked through the priority places for food index in a bit more detail. Um, and we also kind of went through that method of selecting those shortlisted areas in more detail. But um, just drop me an email as well if you, if you have any further questions about that, I'm happy to answer them. Great, thank you. And I can um, also pop in the link to the first session um, that is available on YouTube in the chat as well. And I think we had one comment uh, from Julie in the Q&A section. Um, so yeah, Julie mentioned that she's trying to get the Rotary Clubs um, involved in the food agenda and would love to host a webinar for them. Um, I think that's a great idea. And I think that there might be other uh, businesses and potential stakeholders that would be interested in attending that. So, you know, whether there is um, any, anything else you would like to add, Julie, um, if you'd like to come in to share your experience. Hello. Hi, yes, we can hear you. Oh, hello. Yes. Uh, I think I put in the chat, it's just been so exciting to work with Effie and Gemma and, and et al on, um, on this project. I think for me, I'm a, I used to be a food teacher and we, we 20 years ago, we were saying, you know, if food doesn't stay in part of the curriculum, it, we're going to lose it. And so for me, this has been exciting because I think, you know, it used to be a dirty little secret that there was hunger and um, people were struggling and now it's out in the open so I feel it's we're obligated to do is what whatever we can um so my thing is Rotary uh, I'm part of the Rotary Club 
and people say, oh, really? Oh, we've got hungry people in the UK, nonsense. They give a lot, a lot, huge amounts of money to polio, which is a wonderful cause. And my mission is to try and get them onto the food agenda about sustainability, about with work on food hubs. Um, and I think it, it's kind of an untapped resource because as a club, we give £250 a year to polio. What if we could persuade them to give £250 locally to their local food hubs? Um, so I would love anybody that would like to engage with me on getting Rotary involved. Um, and I hear that the interna new Stephanie Ulrich, that's new head of Rotary for this year, incoming year, which is called the Magic of Rotary, um, is passionate about food. So and 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 uh, food sustainability. So I feel like this is a key time that we could up our ante and get this across the UK into everybody's uh, laps. We've got ten clubs in Bradford and ten in Leeds. So you know, the, it's quite prolific. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Julie. Um, so yeah, if anyone, I, I don't know whether um, you want to leave your contact details in the chat, if anyone wanted to get in touch with you on that. Um, otherwise, we can um, we can share that with the... Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Great. Okay, um, we have one minute of this lunch webinar. So if um, anyone has any last questions, feel free to come in. Otherwise, uh, we'll probably wrap up. First of all, thank you to all of our speakers and the team that joined from Leeds today. And to all of you who've attended, it's been an um, absolute pleasure to share this with you. And uh, I hope you will share, the, will share the slides as well as the link to the recording once it's on YouTube that you can also um, share with your networks and uh, keep an eye on future um, engagement opportunities on this project. Uh, this is not the end, it's just the beginning. So thank you all for joining us on this Friday afternoon and I hope you have a great weekend. And I don't know if any of the other speakers wanted to um anything before we close off. No, just to say thank you to the Food Foundation and Letitia for, for hosting and um, excellent collaboration. And thank you to all the organisations that we worked with. Um, there's a lot of interest and, yeah, looking forward to, you know, working more in this. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye.